All right. So, welcome to lecture seven for the mathematics of data models. This is、um, Northeastern University course called、uh, CS twenty eight ten, and I'm Professor Wu. Today we're going to talk about spaces, rows, columns, null spaces. Okay. So, well. We're gonna start with a set. Set. What is a set? Well, I'm not gonna be too formal about it, but you can think of a set as a collection of distinct elements. Distinct is the key, and we mathematically denote a set with these bra braces. Okay, and we put whatever is inside the set inside the braces, and anything, anything can go inside the set. The set is very, very general, like a set of animals. Right? Notice we put them inside the curly brackets. So dog, cat, fish, bird. You know, set of animals, set of flags. Right, bunch of flags. Right, a set of numbers, positive integers. If your set there's nothing in there, then it is called an empty set. Empty set, which has nothing, and the symbol for that is just kind of circle. With a line across it. Now we like to、uh, denote set by a cursive capital letter.、Yeah. Cursive capital letter. We we tend to like to do that. So now we talked about a set, a space. When you hear people talk here about spaces, it's basically just a set that it has some kind of defined properties. Okay, and you can define the probability however you want. So, here's again these are the sets that we have. So, if you just have a set, you don't necessarily have any properties defined with it. For example, it's with a set of flags. How do you add these two flags? Well, you, it's not defined, right? So, so, so you don't know how you can put one element of the set. Add to another element. This is where this concept of space comes in. Spaces. Well, space is just a set where certain structures are defined. Okay. Once you define it, they make sense. So now, this is a set, right? This is a set, and now I'm going to make it into a space, and I'm going to give it a name. We're going to call it the Professor Wu space. And the Professor Wu space specifically defines addition. How do you add these two flags? Well, it's just the summation of the population of the two countries. Okay, and that's it. You you get the population of one, you get the population of two. Now you can add them together. So Professor Wu space, right? There are many many different spaces with various different definitions. But for me, we just define how you can add two elements. Now, a set can be defined by a vector. Okay, so another way to define a set is through some vector. Let's say we have vector one one. So, the vector one one could be something like this, right? So one one. That's a vector. Now, we can use to define a set as all the possible. Points reachable by some constant multiple of the vector. So if we multiply, so therefore one one is this point, but we can multiply this by two. So two two is also in it. We can multiply by one half. One half and one half is there. Or or we can just multiply by half. So therefore any point, every single point here belongs to the set defined by a vector. So. This is another way to define a set through vectors, and the way you define it will essentially, essentially say that, well,、um, any number, any number multiply by this vector, so will create another vector. So any ve any vector that is possible with any alpha value is part of the set. So essentially, this whole line. So 
obviously minus two minus two is on this line three three is along this line so all of these points will be in the set okay and because this set is defined by vectors it comes with a lot of properties well all the properties like addition subtraction dot products so any point here you will know how to essentially take the addition how to take the subtraction or add now you can imagine that every possible point on this line is part of the set this set essentially would have infinite points in it okay and this will be a one-dimensional space specifically one-dimensional vector space now we just talked about set space and how a set can be defined by vectors. Now, we're going to talk about the concept of span. Span means that means that it's a space, okay? It's created by this. So remember we had this vector and it creates an entire space. This this space And since this space already has various things defined, such as addition and subtraction, so this set, so this set is no longer just a set, but it's a space. And this space, we call it the span of X. So like I told you, X can define a certain space. And that space is called the span. Now, span is 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 rather important it's quite an important concept so the span is essentially the space of all possible points reachable by one or multiple vectors so so we previously showed you the span of that one vector is this entire line right but but uh you can have multiple lines so you can have multiple vectors, maybe this and this, and the span will be different. Now, let me, okay. So here's an example. The red line, right, is the span one, one. So this is the vector. The blue line is one negative one right here. So the span of these two lines like one one the, I mean these two vectors, the span of these two vectors will be any point that is reachable by these combination of these two vectors. So let's say we want to go this point. This means that we can go this direction by this much. And then we can go this direction by this much. So essentially when you have two two lines like this, their span is the entire 2D plane. So any point in this 2D, you will essentially be able to reach it, like here and then here. Okay. Now, span is very important, particularly in machine learning, because very often you are looking at some point, right? And you don't, you don't know where this point is, but the goal is you have some kind of vectors, a bunch of vectors, and you're hoping that these vectors will be able to span this point. All right. So that means you can use combination of vectors to reach this point. Okay. And if you if you have a bunch of vectors and it doesn't span the solution you're always gonna have some kind of error. So let's say this, right? Let's say we have a point C and you're trying to essentially approximate this point using this vector. Notice that this point is not inside the span of this vector. No matter how you change this vector, scale this vector, this, is the, this will only stay in this line. Therefore, Therefore, if you were to use this vector to approximate this point, the closest with the least amount of error would be D. And in this idea, you can kind of see that 
um, when we have vectors, we can use the vectors to approximate, to approximate something, like some other point. And we may or may not succeed. Okay. If we don't succeed, then you're always going to have some kind of error, which is this part. Okay. The span of multiple vectors. So remember I told you the span of a single vector is a set such that you can pick any, any alpha to create a set. Now, for many of you, you are probably not familiar with this notation. This notation is called a set builder notation. It defines a set such that alpha can be any real value. So you pick any real number, all right? It's, it's building a set. And then we'll pick alpha equals to one. So one V, so that's inside the set. You pick two V, that's inside the set. 1.5 V, basically you do this over and over again until you ha uh, have any any real alpha value. So you can imagine this, this notation help us build an infinite set, a set with infinite values, right? Because they're infinite real numbers. So the span of this is the is basically every single possible point where alpha can be real. Okay? So that's just one vector. Now if you have if you have two, three, four multiple vectors, then the span of multiple vectors is the linear combination. So linear combination of of them. So any value that could be reached by any A, B, C. Okay. So we're again building a set. Right? So you pick some A, B, C value, put it in. That's one value inside a set. You pick another one. That's another value. You pick. So basically, if if you pick infinite, then infinite numbers, possibility of A, B, C. You're just going to do every single one of them is going to be inside this set. So that is how a span is constructed. Now, this is this is quite an elusive concept, but um, I cannot emphasize enough the, the importance. But I am aware it's it's actually really tough to understand. Let's say, for example, right right now you have two vectors, right one zero and one one. So you have two vectors. So in this case, the span will be the entire 2D because any point on this 2D plane, such as this one, you can approach it uh, using a combination of these two. So for example, this particular point, D, well, we can approach it using V1 plus half of V2. So V1, right, plus half of V2. This is V2. So if you only do half of it, then 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 you can reach so d is therefore in the span of v1 and v2 now these v1 and v2 that basically end up spanning a space they are called bases when you have the when you have the bases it allows you to define an entire space so Again, every single point in this 2D space can be achieved by some linear combination of the two of them. So, well, we're going to play this game in class, but I'll do the best I can, best I can to describe the game in the video. Okay, So we're going to have a volunteer student. She's going to stand somewhere in the room. She's going to stand somewhere in the room and she's gonna point a direction. So that student one is going to be a vector. So that that location right, is essentially gonna be zero. And she's gonna point, or he, he's gonna point some, some direction. And student two is the target. So the student two is gonna stand maybe right here, right? So if the student is pointing this direction, the span, the space spanned by this student is essentially like this. And every single step 
the student takes, if she takes one step, then she starts at zero, zero. But if she takes one step, she's going to be at one times V. She takes another step, it's going to be two times V. Another step, three times V. So over here is three times V. And of course, over here will be minus one, minus two, minus three times V. So if she is stuck with only, only walking towards the direction which she's pointing at, can she ever reach student two? And the answer is no, because she is stuck on this line. The only way that she can ever reach student two is if the student two happens to be stand somewhere along this line. And that's when the student two is in the span of student one. So student two in the span. So because because the student two is standing somewhere where student one can reach. Okay. And then if the student two is standing here, we can calculate exactly how many steps the student one will have to take to reach student two. So, I mean, in class, we'll do this like for reals. Um, but hopefully you can kind of get the idea of the span. And therefore, student one, this vector, this vector right here, that student one is pointing, this is called a basis. Okay? You use the basis as, to tell you the direction. And with the direction, any, any point along this direction is part of its span. So in game two, in game two, Student one and two are the vectors. So now we have two students. Like over here, here's zero, zero. Let's say student one is pointing this way, right? And student, uh, let's do a 3D. Yeah, let's do 3D. So this is X, Y, Z. So student one is going to point maybe this way. Oh, no, let's go. Let's go along the axis. Student one pointed. Student two will point this way. Student three, let's say student three is standing right here. So how many steps would y would you have to go in the y direction and then go in the x direction to reach student three? The whole point of the game is to show that, well, if student three is here, the combination of student one and two is going to be able to reach student three. Now, if student three is not on, on, on the zero plane, like this is the plane, but if student three is over here instead, right here, so it, this is height, right? Then student one and two can never reach student three because student one and two doesn't have any height. The height is always zero. Okay, so, so that's kind of the point. That's the point of uh, game two. All right, well, game three and four, it gets a little complicated to draw. You, you kind of need to see it in person. So I'm gonna skip it here. And, and game five, it's even more complicated. So we'll, we'll skip that. So hopefully you came to class okay, and you, you will be able to uh, visualize what we're talking about. So different bases, different bases can span the same space. So this is V1 and V2. Obviously, this is different from U1 and U2. However, they span the exact same space, which means any point here right, can be reached by these two, combination of these two vectors. And any point here can also be reached by a combination of these two vectors, right? So over here, I think you can go like, go like, let's see. Yeah, the this one is easy. You go here and then you go here, you can reach it. This one over here, I think you go, yeah, you can go here, right? And then you can go this way, and then you will reach it. So 
You don't need to have the same bases. You can have very different bases, but span the same space. Two vectors does not imply 2D. So over there, I showed you, you have two vectors, and now it spans the 2D space. But sometimes two vectors can span the same space. So one, one is here, right? And then two, two is right here. So you are not adding extra information. Like yours, even, even though you have two vectors, their span is still one line, okay? Now, the true dimension spanned by a set of vectors is called a rank. So just because you have two vectors, it doesn't mean the rank is two. In this case, the rank is only one. Right? If the number of vectors is equal to the number of dimension span, then it's full rank. So you have two vectors, and you happen to span two dimensions. That is called full rank. Okay? Otherwise, your rank is not full. It's only partial. So how do you know if a point in the span for a set of vectors? Okay, how do you know that a point is in the span for a set of vectors? So let's say we have vectors one, two, three, right? And we have a point U. And we want to know if U is inside the span of three vectors. This is equivalent to ask if there is an ABC, right, such that a times some v1, b times some v2, and c times v3, that would equal to u. So you, we have seen this many times, all right? So this right here can be written this way. We have three vectors, and as long as there's some kind of a, some b, some c, that can recreate the output, the, the two and one, that means this point is spanned by these three. Okay. Now, how do we solve this? Well, we this right here is just equivalent to solving this. And we have done this many, many times. This, is, this right here is just Gaussian elimination. This is why I told you previously the Gaussian elimination is so important. Like everything you're solving is like Gaussian elimination. So once you solve this, if you have an infinite or unique solution, that means the target is in the span of the, the vectors here, okay? In this case, we are viewing the vectors, the columns, okay, as the vectors. So it's some combination of these vectors that allows us to reconstruct this point. And therefore, these vectors, columns, form a space. And this space is, is spans, spans this point. We're going to call this space formed by the columns as the column space. So you, you take the columns, you take these columns, right? With the columns, you, they form a space. They define a space, and that space is called the column space. When we look at matrices, sometimes we might want to look at them in terms of rows. So V1 is 1, 1, 2, right? The first row and then the second row. So when you see that, the space formed by the rows of a matrix is called a row space. So now here's some practice questions. I want to pause the video and see if they have solutions. And when they do have solution, this time, instead of thinking of just solutions of A, B, C, I want you to think of them as, as these vectors forming a space. And this space contains the final product, final point, right? There's a point that is within the space spanned by them, okay? So let's try fixing, uh, uh, solving this. Pause the video because uh, I'm going to move on, okay? Here's the solution. Feel free to, feel free to study it. So this leads us to a, yet a new kind of space, right? We have learned column space, and we have learned row space. Another space is called a null space. Now, this is a really, really special space because very often we 
may mathematically model like some kind of system. For example, a boat, right? If we have a boat and we can model, right? Especially like here's a sailboat. So let's assume we have a self-driving sailboat, okay? We have a machine that can control how much we pull the ropes of the sail, okay? So, so we have, this is self-driving one and the machine can pull the sails. By depending on how you pull the sails, it creates a force in some direction, east, north, south, east, west, okay? And that is what the output is. So depending on what we put into X, the output Y sets the direction. So, so let's say you have one, north, south, east, west. So it's applying force in the north direction, or it's applying force in the northeast direction. So as long as there's a value here, it tells you that it's applying force on the boat uh, in a particular direction. Therefore, therefore, there's a very special one is when you apply no force anywhere. And that's when you want the boat to stop. It's kind of important for the boat to stop. So that, that help us understand the null space. So the null space is all possible input of X such that your output is zero, okay? So in this self-driving sailboat example, essentially you want to figure out exactly how much you want to pull each rope so that given the current wind condition, given everything, that you would essentially stop the boat because no forces apply anywhere. Of course, you can just pull up the sail, but this is just an example. Now, to find the null space, it's actually really, really easy. We, just, we found the inverse last time, and the idea is like so similar, right? The idea, like I told you, this right here, if this multiplied by, by the, the, the matrix give you zero, this means it's in the null space. So if you want to find the null space, essentially, you can just form the matrix and make sure the output is zero. That's it, because you are trying to find the output to be zero, right? So once you solve the reduced REF, right, if it has multiple solutions, you can essentially form the null space this way, because this is the solution where the output is zero. So now what you want to do is see this as a matrix. We'll call this matrix A. And we want to find the null space for this. Okay. So here's the matrix. This, this, this part is A. And then you want to make sure that when you form the augment matrix, it's all zero here. Of course, you kind of don't need the augment matrix because it's always zero. This, this is not going to change. It's always going to be zero, regardless of how you do road swap. Like you can try it. You'll, you'll see that's true. So you don't really need it. But just to for consistency, feel free to, to add, put the A, uh, the zero here in the augment matrix, and then proceed to find the reduced row echelon form. Okay, pause the video, and then uh, give this a try. Okay, we're going to move on. So here's the solution. Here's the solution. Make sure you're able to get it. Basically, we got to the reduced row echelon form, got the solution. That's it. Now, you can get the null space from Python. So this was, this was the matrix that I just showed you. Right? To get the null space, you just type null space. Right? You make sure you import it first. But you just type null space of A which is that, that matrix we we're looking at. And notice if we have A dot the null space, the output is exactly zero, okay? Now the null space may have multiple dimensions. Like right here, we have null space of two dimension, okay? You might be wondering, isn't that, isn't that 
one, two, three, four, five, or five dimensions. Yes, the vector is in five dimensions, but the space spanned by these two vectors is just ultimately two vectors in five dimensions, right? If you have two vectors in five dimension, these two vector can at most form a plane, which is 2D. So this is the example where you have two vectors and, or in five dimension, each vector, but the space they span is only two dimensions. And these two, dimension, uh, two vectors, are, like I said, they form the basis of the space. Okay. When somebody asks you about the basis of some spaces, basically the vectors that essentially you use to create this space. So here, notice when I got the null space, they said there are two dimensions. Uh, sorry, when I got the null space, essentially, yeah, you, you, got two, you got two bases, like I just showed you. You have two bases. And therefore, therefore, you when you multiply the null dimension here, you're going to get two columns of zeros. Okay. So let's see. Now, uh, I have to mention when you get when you get the null space, right? When you solve it this way, for example, let's see. When you solve it this way, where you do the reduced row echelon form, the, your solution may not be the same as the one created by NumPy. And that's because uh, a space, right? It's like, I think I told you, if we have two plane, 2D, you can have these two vectors and it will span the entire 2D space. Or you can have these two vectors. It will also span the 2D space. Therefore, what you find by, by hand may not match with what NumPy finds. But the key is if you take what you have and plug it in and take what NumPy have and plug it in where you, multiple, you dot by, dot by um, the matrix A, you are both going to get zero, okay? So remember, we got the null space, and we call it B. And notice that my the B from NumPy is this. We also got the null space by hand, right? So I'm going to write that here. So that is C. And notice when you do C dot A, you also get zero. As, oppo as opposed to B dot A, you also get zero. So both of them will give you zero because they're in the null space, but they are not necessarily the same because like I, I showed you, you can use this and this will span the 2D or you can use this and that will also span the 2D. So I don't know, I don't know how NumPy picked it, but the idea is the same. So in summary, the span for a set of vectors is a set containing all positive values achievable by linear combination of the vectors. Okay, so you're combining them linearly, like a linear function. Different bases can span the same space. So this one and this are different bases, and yet they span the same 2D space. And then we can use Gaussian elimination to determine if a point is within the span of a set. So as long as you use Gaussian elimination, you can show that there exists a solution such that you can reach the target. Then, then, then it's, it does span that point, right? If it doesn't, then it does not span. We called these columns the space spanned by the columns of a matrix column space. And other way, if you 
the space spanned by the rows, I call the row space. Okay. And lastly, the null space of A is a set of all points x, right? Such that Ax is equal to zero. So that's the null space. And I explained to you why null space could be important because very often you want the output to be zero. You want to zero it out. So the null space tells you all the possible inputs. Side note. Well, so I, I don't know if I'm going to talk about in this class, but if you understand the concept of spaces and what they span, right? You can think about how your brain absorb information where your brain has a set of bases, right? Set of bases. And if you're the bases in your brain is, okay, let's say I give you a new piece of information, right? And this piece of information, if it's within the span of your existing bases in your brain, then you can, you can kind of picture that you would be able to understand this concept. Okay, I'll, get, I'll give you a more concrete example. If I say the cat is soft, right? In your brain, there is a basis. There's some direction that understands the concept of cat, right? And it understands the concept of soft. Therefore, it's a combination of cat and soft. So there's a point in your brain, right, that combines the basis of soft and cat. Now, if, if I give you yet a different type of information, I say cat is this thing, and you, you have a basis for cat. Therefore, you're going to understand this part. But this information, the, the true information, is the combination of cat and something Korean, which I have no idea what this says. Right? I don't know what that says. Therefore, therefore, your understanding will only be as close to here. The cat is something, but you are going to have some error of understanding, right? Or if I say this, like the cat is this thing, right? We're going to have some kind of error because we only understand the cat. Only the people that speak Korean, right, possesses this basis. If they have this basis, then they will say, oh, this is combination of cat and whatever Korean says there. Or Russian, like Russian maybe is over here, right? So uh, the, the idea of span and basis really allows you to understand, like, we can even model our own brain based on this. I'm currently trying to, like, like work on this kind of way of thinking about learning and see if we can mathematically uh, uh, model it. But in this example, you have the basis for something, but you're missing some basis. Therefore, this as a point, information point in space, you will always have some kind of error. And over here, here's yet another one, right? If you have no basis, then you are not going to understand anything. Therefore, you'll be a complete error. You, 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 you basically will get no information. You have no idea what's said. All right, I have... I have no idea what this is. So the reason why I push you guys so hard in the beginning is because forming these bases will allow you guys to understand, will allow you guys to understand what happens later. And the more you lag behind, the more you are going to miss these bases. And therefore, when you come to class, you're not going to understand. And the error is simply going to build and build such that basically... You, you will no longer span the incoming information. So when your error gets so big, you are in incapable of building new bases anymore because whatever I tell you, you it's going to sound like this. All right. So essentially, like me putting you through the grind is very important initially because that initial part is like the basis building. I don't know if any of these make sense, but um, but that's that's essentially how my teaching philosophy came from. So for the final exercise, right here's the matrix. You want to 
you want to find a basis for the null space of the matrix, right? You want to find a null space. Uh, recall that the null space is just all the possible x such that the output is zero. And then you want to determine if each of these vectors, right, is in the row space of A, the row space, and then see if these vectors is in the column space of A. Okay, give this a try. I hope uh, I hope that wasn't too hard. Okay, I uh, will see you next class.